It's lovely to be here again. I feel greatly honored to be back here. It's really some years since I was. And what I thought we'd do, I'm going to, I was in Taos last year. I was invited to give a conference, um, a talk at one of the conferences. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to um, move on to my research. Well, before that, we're going to talk about the synchronicity of the labyrinths uh, in connection with the crop circles. Um, last year, I was sent a, a lovely um, email by somebody who said that I find that gazing at pictures of crop circles brings on a very meditative state. And I love to use your book because there isn't a lot of text to distract me, and the photographs are stunning. How's that for a plug? <laughs> Come and see my book afterwards. Incidentally, the stalls are situated downstairs. And as she was looking at these um, pictures, suddenly a word came into her mind which was didactic. Now, this was a word she didn't know. So she went to her dictionary, and she found that didactic in the dictionary said, designed or intended to teach, intended to convey instruction and information, as well as pleasure and entertainment. And many, many is the time that people have asked me, what meaning do crop circles have for you? Well, I think this is on a very personal basis. I think many people might possibly have different answers. But to me, that absolutely fits the bill because I've learned more in the past 20 years than I have ever learned uh, earlier in my life. So they are a profound subject, and uh, I'm sure you'll all have your different um, reasons why you're involved in the crop circle world. Now, to get, go to Taos, I was invited to this uh, wonderful labyrinth conference, and Taos is in New Mexico, it lies 7,000 feet up uh, beneath snow-capped mountains, and it was the most wonderful uh, town, a small town. It was a town of literati with sculptors and poets and authors, and it was just fantastic. And one of the museums there uh, was built by a man called Fetchin. He was Nikolai Fetchin, and he was a Russian artist. Admittedly, I'd never heard of him, but he was renowned in Russia in those days. And it was the days of the revolution, of the Tsarist revolution. He married uh, somebody from the Russian aristocracy, so she had to flee. Uh, he was protected due to his um, artistic ability. But he built his own house, and he was just one of the many, many people living in Taos. And look at the wonderful um, work I'm not certain if this is working. Oh, yes, there we are. Um, can anybody see the pointer? <laughs> I don't think it's working. Uh, let me see if this is working. Ah. I'm going to need that in order to move on. Oh, there you are. Press it hard you could. Work. What? Press it hard. Press it hard. It Whoops. Wait a second. No. Oops. Which slide are we on? We'll go to back, back again, and back, and back. Right, no. So that's backwards, there we are. that's forwards, and then press the button hard. All right. The there we are. Under control, maybe. Um, but as well as being a town of literati, um, it was also a place where the North American Indians lived, the Pueblo Indians. And it was one of the few places, I think in America, that was a World Heritage Site. And they were wonderful people. Um, sadly, they, we'd given them the gift of drink, of alcohol, and many of them had alcoholic problems. But these were their dwellings and their adobes. And what is fascinating that originally um, they didn't have any openings. They didn't have doors or didn't have windows. The only opening was in the top of the, of the house. And they used to go up via a ladder pull up the ladder, and then descend the same way. And the reason they did this was to uh, ward off the attacks of the white man. Eventually, of course, they, uh, they, they succumbed. But that's the, 
um, photograph I took of one of the Pueblo North American Indians, you can see what a magnificent face he's got. And the wisdom of those people is absolutely amazing. It's a simple but profound wisdom. This is a man called Tlacatel, and he is a Toltec uh, North American Indian. He actually comes from Mexico. Uh, he was 87 years old. He's traveled the world, he's met the Dalai Lama, and when he heard of my close connection to the Mohawks, he said he wanted to do um, a day with me, a workshop with me. Well, you can imagine I was profoundly honored. And the day came, and it was a wonderful day. There were well over 100 people in the audience. I perched on the edge of the stage, and he sat with his interpreter. He speaks, he understands English, but I think he has difficulty conveying what he wants to say in, in, uh, in English, so he has an interpreter. And we tell stories, and we tell stories all day long. I could tell stories all day long, and so could he. And he was very interesting about 2012, Many people are worried about 2012. And he said the shift started in 1947, and he wouldn't be budged from that. And I looked up on the internet to see what indeed had happened in 1947, and it was the year when an American, it was the first time somebody broke the speed of sound, an American, it was just after uh, Hiroshima, Hiroshima, and also it was the year of the Roswell event. But he's a lovely person. He, he speaks in the language of the natural world, of the streams and the mountains and the birds and the beasts, and this amazing deep wisdom. And quantum physics aren't any problem to him because they're part of the natural world too. So it was a quite incredible experience. Um, then we went one evening to a specially designed labyrinth now, this was constructed by somebody called Akhtar, another North American, Indians, American Indian, and he'd constructed this on the same geometric principles as the pyramids. And there were a whole series, 1,352 little bags, paper bags full of sand, into which was placed, placed, it, uh, placed a, a lighted candle. And there were... 1,352, that is 8 times 8 times 13, and I can't remember the significance of it, but it did have some particular significance. And you'll see all these extraordinary lights or orbs, and nearly everybody, when they took photographs, these orbs appeared. And there's one there which is particularly uh, vivid, and I'll show you in a second. Oops. Oh, what's happened? Am I going wrong? <laughs> Sorry, okay. new technology. Which slide were you on? Um, that one, yeah. We're going on to the next one. Very good, thank you. And as you can see, this one there, it's almost as though it has information in the cellular structure. Um, now, I know a lot of this can be explained in plasma physics, but some of these um, orbs move with an intelligence, which is way beyond what we can really understand. And when I asked Akhtar about these, he said, oh, those were the spirits of his ancestors. And we went to labyrinths all over the place. Uh, they're laid on sacred spots by a North American Indian, and their energy comes from the ground and also comes from the geometry uh, of the actual labyrinth. And everyone has their own particular energy.